our, my friend and um, former Stanford student with me, uh, Keith Hennessy, is here today. We're really lucky. Uh, he is a lecturer at the Stanford uh, Graduate School of Business of Economic Policy. <clears throat> I'm really, really, really glad we got on his calendar before the November election because he has been mm, just a little busy since then, as you, as you might imagine. Keith is probably one of, I, I might make him blush, but he probably is one of the world's leading experts on how economic policy is made in Washington. He worked for two senators, so he has le great legislative branch experience, and if you know anything about the power structure in the Senate, he worked for the Senate Majority Leader. So he was in the thick of what was going on in Capitol Hill. Then he was hired by um, George W. Bush, when uh, President George W. Bush, to work in the White House. He led the um, National Economic Council. He worked on that for six years. So he was in the middle of everything economic related, uh, economic policy related during his tenure. So um, climate change, tax cuts, you can ask him about kind of any of that that you want. Uh, he has experience with it. So he's got legislative branch experience, executive branch experience. He was at, um, on um, in Washington, D.C. for 14 years. He now teaches here and has a standing room only, always sold out, waitlisted course. Uh, if you follow him on Facebook, he actually often posts what his agenda for his um, classroom day is, how, the, how, it, how it went. It's a, it's a great learning tool for me. He is one of the most um, balanced, intellectually balanced uh, people that I know in terms of his approach to politics. So I, um, I really, I welcome you uh, to welcome Keith today. I also want to like, let you know one thing about him that's going to make you love him even more. It was he who put together the do not call policy. So thank him if you have a chance <laughs> afterwards. So I welcome my friend Keith Hennessy. Thank you. Thanks, it's the great thing about um, Longtime friends is they'll they'll overhype you. Uh, actually, uh, one of my staff was responsible for the do not call policy, but um, uh, I like to joke it was it's the most popular policy of the Bush administration, um, <laughs> bar none. So um, you're welcome for my small part in that. Okay, um, all right, we're we're on day 21. How are we doing? <laughs> Holy mackerel. Um, I came and spoke, um, uh, uh, Elizabeth uh, brought me in about a week, maybe 10 days before election day. Um, and I, I walked uh, that group through sort of a, a transition scenario, what the transition would, would, you know, would look like and some contingency planning and sort of walked that crowd through, let's think about things that President-elect Hillary Clinton will need to consider. <laughs> I was looking over my notes a couple weeks ago. It's just just throwing things out. It's just it's absolutely astonishing. Okay, um, okay. So let's first start off with just a little bit of the economic status where we are right now. Um, level of the economy pretty darn strong. Four point eight percent unemployment. Uh, most economists will say that full employment they'll use a number anywhere between five point zero percent and five and a half percent. So sort of low fives. Um, the term that, uh, that we use is called the NIRU, the Non-Accelerating Inflation Rate of Unemployment. The idea is, is that at any given point in time, there are going to be some people who are unemployed. Right? They just graduated from high school or college, or they, they're in a transition period between one job and the next. So you're always going to have this frictional employment and this turnover. Um, so you're never going to get down to zero. There is some low level of unemployment below which, if you, if you fall below that, then you actually have to start to worry about wage pressures pushing up inflation. Um, so we're right about at that now. So that is a good level of unemployment. We created about 161,000 net new jobs last month, which is a, a little more than you need to keep up with population growth. Um, GDP growth this year projected to be about 2% real. That's a relatively benign but slow growth rate. One of the big questions, I'm an economic policy guy, one of the things that's so frustrating to me about my, my egghead friends, the PhD economists, is they have not been able to explain why the rate of real GDP growth has been so slow during this recovery. Everybody was surprised by it. Right? The economy bottomed out in about mid-2009, and it's been growing for coming up on eight years, but it's been growing very slowly and much more slowly than people anticipated, and we really don't understand why. This is an important question where I could use help from my more academic friends, but they're still struggling with this and still arguing about this. 
Um, on inflation, you know, right in the target range, mid to high ones. Um, productivity, again, continues to be slow. This is related to the real, slow real GDP growth. Fed funds rates, you know, a little above half a percentage point. Um, I'm always worried about the European banks um, just because I don't think that the Europeans did enough to strengthen their capital bases and, and liquidity requirements the way that, um, that we did in the US after the financial crisis. So if you, if you ask me one thing to worry about in terms of a shock, that's what I'm going to worry about. Okay. Um, Global risk, this is not my area, but if I just sort of have to make a, a bullet point list of areas of the world that I'm going to worry about as an economic guy, this is what it looks like. Um, actually, I didn't have that first bullet on there and then realized that I need to. Um, and I, I, I criticize um, our current administration, you know, I, I don't hold back on that. But I don't mean this really as a, as a point of criticism, more as a point of analysis which is the new president is coming in. He clearly <coughs> intends to send different signals to different countries. His posture toward Russia is very different from his predecessor. Whether you think that's good or bad, it means that every other leader in the world is trying to figure out what is the new relationship between US and Russia going to be, and how's that going to affect me in my smaller country somewhere. And then I may change my behavior, which then may cause US policymakers U.S. investors, U.S. business leaders, U.S. markets to react. So there's sort of a, a feedback effect you have to worry about when the, you know, the biggest power in the world is looking at potentially fundamentally reshuffling some of these relationships. When the president throws in a monkey wrench like getting into a fight with the prime minister of Australia, it further increases the uncertainty that everyone has about, okay, you know, if he's in a squabble with Australia, what does that mean for other areas? Um, and then you can see the list here. OK. Um, I think one of the things, especially in the stuff that, that I've typically worked on, which is sort of domestic and economic policy, I think one of the points that's been missed is that everybody focuses on the president and they focus on Donald J. Trump. Right? And they focus on the president because our eye is naturally attracted to the role of the president and to the White House. And the press and the media help that. And then, of course, we can't look away from the man Donald Trump, whatever our feelings are about him. Right? He naturally attracts all of the attention. I actually can make the argument that, to some extent, even more important is the simple, uh, how's my laser doing here, is the simple RRR. And what I mean by that is we have a Republican majority House, a Republican majority Senate, and a Republican in the White House. To some extent, on issues of domestic and economic policy, I can argue that the most important thing is that we now no longer have a president who would veto traditional right of center and conservative legislation that a Republican Congress might send to the president. Right? We had a Republican majority House and Senate for the past several years, and they would send bills to President Obama, and everyone would sort of know how the game is played which is a Republican Congress sends a conservative bill to President Obama. He vetoes it. The Congress tries to override it. They fail to override it. Everyone shrugs. They point fingers, and they move on to the next issue. Okay? All of those things now, if you're Paul Ryan or Mitch McConnell or a Republican committee chairman, all of a sudden what you know is, gosh, if I can just do what we did a few years ago, pass the same exact bill, we can probably get this president to sign it. So it means that a whole bunch of sort of standard right of center conservative policies, whether you like them or don't like them, all of a sudden now no longer have this institutional barrier, which is a likely to certain veto threat. That is, that is a fundamental restructuring, and it is independent of which Republican is president. It's just having a, not having a president who's going to veto, who you know is going to veto the more conservative policies that you'd want to do. OK. Um, Paul Ryan and Kevin McCarthy, the House Republican leaders, have a surprisingly comfortable re Republican majority and a stable leadership. Um, for anyone who was paying attention before the 2016 campaign heated up, the big story on the Republican side was sort of the ongoing Republican war, Tea Party versus establishment. Right? And it was the Republican leaders who were always being attacked. John Boehner lost his job, you know, or he stepped down as speaker. Right, as a part of that ongoing tension. And so the big question for a while has been, would the Republican majority leadership in the House, who are nominally a, a majority party, would they ever be able to hold together 218 Republicans for anything because they were so split? 
With the election of Donald Trump, that problem is just way toward the back of the queue. It is just, it, it doesn't appear to be a problem right now. Republicans have plenty of other problems to deal with, but internal dissension right now is not at the forefront of Paul Ryan and Kevin McCarthy sort of, as they're thinking about what they're doing, that's not their top issue. Mitch McConnell, um, Senate Republicans, surprised everybody with a narrow uh, Republican majority, 52-48, which means they've got two votes to give on any partisan split issue. Um, which having worked for a Senate Majority Leader, that's very tough because senators think about themselves as individuals. You can never assume that all the members of your party are gonna vote your own way, and so on any given issue, they're going to have to be going to every single member and trying to figure out, can we hold 50 of 52 votes? Now what you would hope, and when I was a Senate staffer in the 90s, is my boss Trent Lott was always saying, you know what, I got a narrow Republican majority, let's go shopping for Democrats. Let's find some moderate Democrats, they tended to be Southern Democrats, let's see how we can moderate our policies to try to accommodate some of them so that you're looking at a universe of 57, 58, 60, 61, your Republicans and a handful of Democrats to try to, to build a broader bipartisan coalition. Harder to do right now. Okay, next big change in sort of the overall political and legislative and policy landscape is we have a new Democratic Senate leader. Harry Reid is, has now retired. Chuck Schumer from New York is now the Democratic Senate leader. And because of sort of the institutional structure of the Senate and the House, in my view, he becomes significantly more important than Nancy Pelosi, who is his House counterpart. So he's new to the job. He's not new to the Senate. Right, he's an old hand, he served in the House, he served in the Senate, but he is new in this role, and so I'm gonna be watching, I have been watching Schumer for a long time, but I'm watching sort of how is he adapting to the new role, how is he interacting with Mitch McConnell, his counterpart, how is he interacting with Paul Ryan, the Republican House Speaker, how is he interacting with the President? Pretty easy for me to make the argument that Chuck Schumer is the second most powerful person in Washington because you've got the president out there in the lead, and then on anything that can be filibustered, Schumer is potentially the gatekeeper. And if, there's, if there is a policy that President Trump and Schumer agree to, it's probably going to happen. If one of the two of them disagree with it, the odds of that policy making its way into law drop precipitously. Okay? And then, uh, obviously, the other big change in terms of structure of the government, we've had a vacancy in the Supreme Court for, what, a year and a half now, or a year now. Um, uh, the president has uh, nominated someone to fill that vacancy. That's making its way through the process. In the interim, we're dealing with a 4-4 court, which has repercussions on issues that bubble up to the Supreme Court in the interim. Okay. So we've got our economic outlook. We've got sort of our structure of government outlook. Okay, um, personnel. When you're starting up an administration, you gotta hire people. Um, and that is not a trivial task. All of the attention is paid generally to the cabinet. We, our eye is naturally attracted to the cabinet secretaries. I pay much more attention to who the senior White House personnel are. These are the people who are physically close to the president. Their, their job is to think about what the president needs, how the president is making decisions, and so I have been paying a lot of attention to who is the president hiring as his senior White House advisors. Uh, most of those jobs are filled. Communications director, and then the top academic economist, the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors. Um, those are the two big slots that are yet to be filled. Um, there are a lot of mid-level White House jobs that are still vacant. Um, Elizabeth uh, pointed out I ran the National Economic Council for my last year, 2008. I was the deputy. I was the number two at the NEC for about five years before that. Those are sort of the even more behind the scenes jobs who, who keep the trains running on time, who sort of do all the blocking and tackling of policy and legislative work, and they're still filling in those jobs. It is very, very difficult to have a functioning White House if you don't have those mid-level jobs, jobs staffed up because the executive branch of the government is just enormous. There are things popping up all the time, and the seven or eight senior White House staff whose names you know from the press can't possibly handle all those things. They need deputies and then staff below them to sort of help them manage all of the nightmares that crop up um, when you're working in, in the executive branch. Okay, cabinet. Uh, he's nominated uh, candidates for all of them. He's got, what, 
four, five, six, seven, eight confirmed. So those are the confirmed cabinet slots on the left. Those are the nominees on the right. Um, Senate Democrats have been kicking up a lot of dust on some of them, but uh, I would bet heavily um, that all of those pending nominees will be confirmed. Um, uh, maybe there's trouble at labor, which for some reason, maybe that's why I don't have it on the list, which is a mistake. <laughs> no offense to our labor secretary nominee. Um, but uh, I think all of them uh, will be confirmed. Um, an interesting little detail here is that uh, traditionally it is, uh, there's been the opportunity for the minority party to filibuster a nomination. Now, filibustering a nomination in the Senate is a very rare occurrence at the cabinet level. Sort of the norms of the Senate, you almost never did that. Over the last several years, there were more threats of that and even more so on the judge side. And so, I don't know, a couple years ago, when Harry Reid was the Democratic Senate Majority Leader, he lowered the filibuster threshold from 60 to 50 votes. And what he said was, basically, even if the minority party filibusters one of my nominees, I can still confirm it as long as I have 50 votes plus the vice president. Because of that change that he made in the rules, in the rules of the Senate a few years ago, now, even if the minority party in the Senate, the Senate Democrats, filibuster President Trump's nominees, they're still going to be confirmed as long as Mitch McConnell, the majority party, can hold together 50 of 52 votes. So for any of you who are on Facebook, uh, and I guarantee, like me, you were seeing lots and lots of posts about Betsy DeVos for Education Secretary, right? and all of the dust up, because she just got in by 51 votes, the vice president broke the tie, that was in part affected by lowering the threshold from 60 to 50 votes. OK. Uh, To-do list for the head of White House personnel. Uh, you've got about uh, 800 additional Senate confirmed jobs, PAS, presidential appointment, comma, Senate confirmed. So these are your deputy secretaries and your undersecretaries and your assistant secretaries scattered throughout the executive branch and all of the different different agencies. So you got 800 more of those people to nominate, vet, um, and then get through the confirmation process. You have, that's not including your ambassadors and your US attorneys. And then you have about another 3,000 additional presidentially appointed jobs, political appointments, that are at a somewhat lower level that don't go through the confirmation process. So you're looking at something like 4,000 more people to hire. And of course, one of the issues that you have to deal with is every time you make a mistake here, you can be guaranteed that it will be highlighted by the press. So it's, it's sort of a, there's a, there should be a very high threshold for making sure that you don't make a lot of horrific mistakes in doing this. And you're gonna make some if you're picking 4,000 people, but it, that also slows things down. Okay. Okay, actions so far. What have they focused on? Uh, personnel, White House, and the Cabinet. They're slow on their sub-Cabinet slots. Um, they should have deputy secretary and undersecretary nominees' names out there so far, starting to move through the process. Um, if they do have their act together, we'll start to see those over the next week or two. Um, if the chaos that I'm seeing in other parts of the White House pervade here, then they'll be rolling out very slowly. And that'll be an issue just because they won't have their appointees in the jobs where they need them. Supreme Court nomination is a huge, huge, huge one. It's one slot, it's one person, but it is enormous in terms of its impact. And then they've been cranking out a bunch of executive orders and other executive actions. Um, executive order, actually, I should have uh, written there, executive actions. And, and executive order is actually a term of legal art in the administration of government. Executive actions are things that the president and his executive branch can do without Congress. And all of these things are things that they had queued up during the transition period. They sort of had their arrows ready to go so that on January 20th, they could start moving those through. Okay? They haven't done a great job with all of them. Uh, the immigration one, uh, obviously, they botched um, in terms of the implementation. And maybe we can talk about that in a bit. OK, uh, that's their list of their legislative proposals so far. Um, and my friends uh, who work for sort of the senior members, uh, senior Republicans in the House and Senate are getting a little frustrated because they're saying, you know, White House, we need some, 
We need some guidance. We need to know where the president wants to go, what his priorities are. We're dealing with a bunch of questions here that we need to answer. Our Republican members have different points of view, right? You want to do X, you want to do Y. They'll both fall in, you know, one of the two of you will fall in line if the president chooses X or Y. Please choose so that we can, you know, twist the arm of whichever one we need to to get everybody on the same page and move through. And if the White House isn't giving them that feedback, then it's harder to move anything through the legislative process. Okay, uh, this was my slide from uh, my late October um, uh, <laughs> presentation. Um, this is when uh, we all knew um, that we would be talking about President Hillary Clinton. Um, uh, this was, these were the legislative options. This was a, basically a laundry list of items from the Clinton campaign, all of her priorities. One of her problem was when you have 100 priorities, you don't have any priorities, but she had all of these things that she had talked about in the campaign, and their challenge was going to be which of these things do they want to tee up first, okay? Um, these are the things that from my standpoint, I know the president has teed up. I'm sure that you know, some of his people would say, oh, you forgot X or Y or Z. I'm, I'm inferring this from things the president talks about all the time personally, things that he's sending his advisors out to talk about all the time. It's a much shorter list, um, and uh, I separate it in my world into the legislative proposals and then the things that he can do on his own. Um, and then uh, he's basically at this point uh, with strong signals on economic and immigration questions. He hasn't really branched out into too many other areas, at least not at his level. Right? If Jeff Sessions, the new attorney general, says, I'm going to do something about uh, the federal, the Justice Department's interactions with cops, I don't put that on my list here. I put that on the Jeff Sessions Attorney General list. If the president starts talking about it repeatedly and saying it's a top priority, then I think of it as a presidential priority. Okay? Okay. Talk about the, about the party politics, the congressional party politics. So Republicans generally unified for now. Um, an advantage is House and Senate Republicans seem to be pretty well coordinated. Um, it's not always been the case. Um, and they have strong leadership. They don't have the problems that they had from 2010 through 2016, where the leaders were always at threat of being dethroned by, by their, their rebel factions, the Tea Party crowd. Um, uh, downsides, they are not used to being a governing majority. Now, House and Senate Republicans have been the majority party for several years, but when you know that all of your good conservative policies are gonna be vetoed by the president, you don't quite have to worry as much about getting all the details right, right? Now you're shooting with real bullets. Now you have to say, okay, maybe can we be more aggressive because this is going to be going into law or are our members going to be a little more skittish and not be willing to take as many risks because we're actually going to see how this plays out when the president signs it into law. Big policy changes are hard. Um, tax reform is sort of one of the big issues. This is one of my frustrations with my own party is that Republicans like to go out there and promise benefits from tax reform and say it is going to be great. It is rainbows and candy everywhere. And the fact is there's a reason why fundamental tax reform was last done 31 years ago in 1986. It is probably the most legislatively difficult type of economic policy change you can make. Because all of the money that you need to raise in tax reform is not in these little targeted tax breaks that every politician loves to rant about. The actual money to be raised if you're doing a fundamental restructuring of the code is in a handful of tax preferences that are broadly popular and very bipartisan. The deductibility of charitable contributions, the exclusion of employer-provided health insurance, retirement incentive savings, the deductibility of home mortgage interest. All of these things, that's where the money is in tax reform. The political support for the deductibility of, home mor of mortgage interest is not Republican or Democrat, it's sort of very broad based. And if you want to do a big fundamental tax reform, you have to be tackling some of those kinds of changes and that's when members get skittish. So a big challenge for the Republicans who have been saying for years, we're gonna do a big tax reform plan is now they're going to be forced to confront the downsides, the policy downsides, and the political risks incumbent with doing what they've been promising. And they're at risk because they've been over-promising, and they, they have to worry about under-delivering relative to that. 
Uh, frankly, they're scared of the president's Twitter account. Um, and I mean that exactly as it sounds. Um, and if the president, if you're a Republican member of the House or Senate and you really don't like something the president has said on a policy matter or culturally or just something he said you find horrible or offensive, right? you are, if you're, a, if you're say a Republican member of the House and you're trying to figure out do I criticize the president of my own party, right? and you're saying should I do this, and you're thinking, uh, so John, John's thinking, well, you know, I completely disagree with what the president said, but John's also thinking that one tweet can say, John isn't a true American, doesn't love America, someone should challenge him in a primary. And John will have two primary challengers by middle of next week. So if you're thinking about, you know, I want to run for re-election, you have to decide, do you, does John want to be the first one to put his head up? on a question like that. And you know, they are rational, they are understanding those risks, and, and they know that, that there's a cost um, to, to taking that on. Um, and then they're nervous about an uncertain and unpredictable White House. Because the president hasn't defined what his priorities are, because they don't have a clear sense of sort of a set of principles guiding the thought process and policy, and because they've seen both during the campaign and the initial days the policy changes, the president says something, you really like what he said, you want to get out there and support the president, but you're worried that maybe, what if I get out there and I support him, and then 48 hours from now, he does a complete 180, right? The president's got some degree of Teflon protection. He can get away with it, or he seems to be getting away with it. You know, you're a rank and file second term House member, you're gonna have a tough time explaining to the paper why you've now suddenly flip-flopped along with the president, or why you're now disagreeing with the president. Um, and then, as I mentioned, uh, on the Hill, they're looking for White House policy leadership, and they're not getting it yet. Okay, on the Democratic side, also generally unified. Um, and in my view, I think um, Schumer and Pelosi are very strong leaders. Um, I have a tremendous amount of professional respect for Leader Pelosi. Uh, I think really she was the one who deserves credit for the enactment of the Affordable Care Act. I think it was mostly her legislative work that made it happen. Not a big fan of the ACA, but I have to give credit where it's due in terms of it would not have happened without her leadership. I think she's very effective. And I have a tremendous amount of respect for uh, for Senator Schumer. I think he's a very good leader. I think he knows what he's doing. I probably disagree with him far more often than I would agree with him on matters of economic policy, but that doesn't mean that I can't respect his abilities, um, and I think he'll probably be significantly more effective than his predecessor was in that job. There's no obvious national leader yet, and if you look down at that, that sort of bottom bullet, um, Barack Obama, and then everybody knew that Hillary Clinton was next in line on the Democratic side of the aisle. So if you were sort of on the next rank of Democratic politicians, it's been very hard for you to get airtime over the past eight years. So someone like Cory Booker is just now getting the attention that I would argue he should have been getting or could have been getting four or five or six years ago. Right? But instead, everyone was sort of, well, we know who the, the leader of the Democratic Party is now, and we know who the next leader of the Democratic Party is, so why should I pay, pay attention to anybody else, to Kristen Gillibrand or any of those other politicians who can be in the new ranks? And so it's going to take some time for them to all get their attention, for them to develop a national presence. And so in the interim, what you've got is basically Schumer, Pelosi, Sanders, and then maybe Elizabeth Warren out there as very high-profile figures and a lot of others who are, who are going to be kind of trying to make their name. Um, it's pretty easy for me to make the case that I can see things happening in the Democratic Party now that I saw happening in the Republican Party in 2011. Um, not just moving leftward on policy issues, but moving to a reflexively anti-Trump position. Right? The 2009-2010 Republican Tea Party was sort of a small government libertarian, not very anti-Obama type faction, and then over time it morphed into a more traditional, more partisan, more zero-sum stylistic opposition, which was reflexively anti-Obama, anti-Democrat. Um, and I think I can see those kinds of things. And that's the big tension right now on the Democratic side, is if you're a Democratic member and President Trump advocates a policy where he agrees with you, should you team up with him? Right? You know, you've long been a champion of reopening NAFTA. President Trump says, 
he wants to reopen NAFTA, should you compliment President Trump for adopting the view that you've been advocating for 10 years? As a policy matter, yes, but right now the politics of the Democratic Party are such that you complimenting President Trump on almost anything places you at tremendous risk in terms of the broader politics within your party. Um, the energized base, um, to the extent that the party is moving left um, on substance, uh, is great for raising turnout, but if you look at the Senate seats that are the Senate Democrats who are up for re-election in 2018, they tend to be from centrist purple type states. Right? You're not, if you're, if you're Schumer and you're looking at the map, you're not worried about your Californias and your Massachusetts, your, your solidly deep blue states where the Democrat always wins re-election. You're worried about North Dakota and West Virginia, states which can go Republican or Democrat. And if the party as a whole is moving very aggressively to the left, it makes it tougher for those more moderate Democrats, to the extent they still exist, to try to figure out how are they going to balance the different political environments that they find in each of their states. OK, and then we've got the calendar. Uh, February 28th is a big deal. Set your DVRs. The president will be addressing the Congress. I will be paying a lot of attention to that speech, as will, I think, everyone in Washington trying to figure out what signals is he send, sending and in what level of detail. Um, sometime around then, he should also send his initial budget proposal to Congress, which will be a very big deal. Um, up first legislatively, they basically have to do the budget. They have to finish leftover spending bills from last year. And I expect with the new administration, they will want to shoehorn in some additional money for defense spending um, and then maybe for his wall. Um, and then they'll have to deal with the debt limit increase um, sometime in the first or second quarter of this year. These are the three big things, the ACA, tax reform, and infrastructure. Those are sort of the big things that the president has defined as the initial components of his economic agenda. The most important thing to understand is that that is a different list than if you had had a Republican President Romney or Rubio or Walker or Jeb Bush or Cruz or anyone who is sort of a more traditional um, style of Republican where you might have seen entitlement reform on there, you might have seen free trade things on there. Um, this is a different list. Um, this is a subset of the list that you would have seen with a different, more traditional Republican on economic policy. OK. Um, Lots of friends and colleagues express their frustration about things that they're seeing out of Washington right now. And when I'm talking with them, I find that they, they're venting their frustration to me, and they're all jumbled in their frustration. They're changing what they're frustrated about, sometimes within the same sentence. And what I always try to teach my students to do is I say, let's unpack it. Right? Let's unpack the different layers of this to try to understand why specifically you're concerned with what you're seeing, or let's analyze this and, and let's understand it. And so for the Trump administration right now, I have four buckets. So I'm going to give you my four bucket model. OK, bucket one is the traditional conservative Republican policy set. These are policies that the Trump administration is pushing forward that in my experience are no different from the kinds of policies that I would expect to see from a more traditional Republican president right now. So these are things that when, when President Trump says, we're going to expedite approval of the Keystone and Dakota pipelines, I would have expected President Rubio to do that, or President Jeb Bush, or President Romney, and any others. That's, that's sort of standard Republican dogma, if you will. Okay? I needed a label for that. So I labeled it the Pencian bucket. Because in my view, Mike Pence sort of is a nice shorthand for a standard conservative Republican. And he's there, and he's right next to the president, so I'll think about that. I don't specifically mean Mike Pence. So if you know something about Mike Pence or his policies, this is not specific to him. This is the Pence, Ryan, Romney, Rubio, McConnell, Republican establishment, if you will, kind of bucket. Okay? Two. What I'll label as new policy approaches. I, I initially labeled this my nationalism bucket, but it turns out that there are a bunch of different things that fit in here. They don't all fit under the nationalism, nationalism label. So these are policy differences between this administration and bucket one. 
areas where the Trump policy view outlook on the world is different than what I would expect of a traditional Republican administration. To some extent, you might think of this, to those of you who are following this, as the Steve Bannon, Stephen Miller bucket, right? Which are, are sort of a version of what is labeled as nationalism. Um, economic populism as opposed to the free market type uh, economics. Um, and protectionism as opposed to a free trade type approach. And then very different policies on, on foreign policy, which include sort of an increased isolationist type approach, a different relationship with Russia, treating a lot of our international um, relations as zero-sum economic issues, right? You know, talking about NATO in the context of uh, they're not paying for it, which is sort of very different from how you might expect a Mike Pence or a Paul Ryan or a Mitt Romney or George Bush to talk about sort of a traditional alliance. Um, nativism, which in my view accompanies sort of the isolationism and the economic policy, uh, populism, and I don't mean that as a positive thing. Um, and then the thing that makes this weird is that in some ways he's also different from what I think of as the Pentium bucket in that he's doing things that are actually more moderate on social policies. So uh, I think it was earlier this week or maybe last week when um, his administration announced that they were not going to change an executive order from the Obama administration on workplace protections for lesbian and gay and bisexual workers. That's not what you would have expected from a traditional Republican administration with a social conservative, strong social conservative wing. Right? It is different. And here, what's going through my mind is, huh, you know, this might be what I might expect from a moderate, socially moderate New York or Northeast Republican. Right? And you see sort of elements of that. But this second budget bucket are all things that differ from what I might expect from a, from a traditional Republican presidency. Third bucket. Things specific to the man. <laughs> okay, I've labeled this in a very neutral fashion. Um, but these are, are things that are actually specific to him. These are personality things. These are things about his work habits. This is, we now have a president who is tweeting. Um, this is how he interacts with people, how he interacts with the press. All of the things that make him as a person in this job different. As a former White House staffer, you know, reading that he doesn't read memos, or he doesn't read a memo more than one page, I just kind of collapse in a puddle. How do you do your job sort of briefing a president for decisions? You know, my short memos were two and a half pages. Um, and you know, President Bush was getting a briefing book this thick every single night. Um, you know, how, do, how do you do your job to to tee up decisions in this new environment. That's one element. Then with all of the personality things, all of the cultural signals that he sends, all of the ways that he interacts with people. Okay. That's, can you see how, how I'm thinking of that differently from the policies, the two different policy buckets? Right. And then the fourth is what I think of as org chart and management things. Buckets three and four are related, but org chart and management things, this is what a lot of uh, my former colleagues from the Bush administration and policy professionals with whom I've worked about, this is what we spend all of our time talking about. Right? This is things like signaling that the White House chief of staff is not above all of the other staff, saying that Steve Bannon is on a par with, with Reince Priebus. Um, this is having six or seven close advisors who have ill-defined portfolios and responsibilities, each of whom sort of have a minister without portfolio type of role. This is having five different senior officials who are nominally um, the senior people on trade policy. Gary Cohn running the National Economic Council, Bob Lighthizer, the trade representative, the Secretary of Commerce, Wilbur Ross, Peter Navarro running a new National Trade Council, and a new special trade negotiator in the White House. That's a disaster, whatever your trade policy is. And I'm pretty sure that I'm going to disagree with the administration. In fact, not pretty sure. I am absolutely certain I'm going to disagree with the trade policy this administration because for them trade policy is falling in bucket two. I'm a hardcore free trader, they're not. But having five different people in charge of trade policy is separable from the question of what, whatever, what that trade policy is. Um, I am at least as concerned about the lack of organization, the lack of clearly defined responsibilities, sort of the mess in the org chart at the top of the West Wing, as I am 
about the issues in policy two, in bucket two, that I disagree with, or the Trump-specific things that make me uncomfortable in bucket three. And if you want an example of this, look at the immigration and refugee EO that came out, I guess it was 13 days ago. Right? If, you, if you can, for the moment, set aside whatever your policy concerns are with that, the way that they developed the policy, the way that they rolled it out, the way that they communicated it, the way that they've argued it in court has been an unmitigated disaster. That's bucket four. And when you're talking about the executive branch, the top of the executive branch of the most powerful nation in the world, you can make a lot of really big unforced errors that can hurt a lot of people controlling for the policy differences. That's a serious concern. Okay. A little bit about how policy is made. Um, there are policy councils within the White House. These are the people who are now running the policy councils. Michael Flynn's running the National Security Council. Gary Cohn is the NEC, where I used to work. Uh, Stephen Miller and Andrew Bremberg basically running what we had as the Domestic Policy Council, and Tom Bossert as the Homeland Security Advisor. The way things work is that every policy issue that comes to the attention of the president belongs to one of these, one of these entities within the White House. Gary Cohn is responsible for identifying economic policy decisions that President Trump has to make, for making sure the president has all the information and advice that he needs, for making sure that the president makes a decision when the decision is needed, and then once the decision is made, for making sure that the executive branch actually implements the decision. Okay. This is what I did for George Bush for six and a half years. I was the deputy to the Gary Cohn person for five years and then moved up to the top slot for the last year. This is hard because the executive branch is enormous and because almost every policy issue spans so many different parts of the federal government. Well, let me give you an example. Oh, and then the budget director is the other big one who's uh, controlling the purse strings. Okay, this is what a policy meeting with the president looks like. This is the Roosevelt Room of the White House. This is obviously a foreign policy meeting there, right, if we've got the Secretary of State sitting next to him, and then a general at the end of the table. Um, so this is, don't know what the topic is, but this is President Obama meeting with his advisors on some national security issue. Every single one of those people is cabinet or deputy cabinet rank. Those are senior people, and the thing that I want you to look at is, look at how many people are around the table. Every single one of those people is responsible for some element of this decision and someone made a decision that the president needs to have every single one of those people there to make a good decision. Let me give you an example on immigration policy. If I were setting up an immigration policy meeting with the president and thinking about all the different aspects and consequences, these are the advisors the president needs to have in the room. And if you, if you kind of look down the list, you can sort of understand why each one of those people has a very strong argument for being, right? Secretary of State, we are talking about interactions with foreign countries. Defense, Homeland Security, um, you need the Customs and Border Patrol and the people running ICE, right? Office of Management and Budget, because there's gonna be money involved. Um, uh, and then we have lots of White House staff over here. I counted up at least 21 advisors in the room with the President. And the job of the policy council is to get all of that advice so that if you have a 60-minute meeting with the president and you have 21 senior people in the room, by the way, these are not shrinking violets. These are not people who are going to let somebody else talk for them. Right? And so how do you take 21 advisors to the president with one hour of time and focus the meeting on the president and the information that he needs so that he can make a good decision? They didn't do this with the immigration EO. As best we can tell, it was Stephen Miller and Steve Bannon taking some work from the transition, looping in a couple other people, and just making it happen. Consequence of that, setting aside the fact that I disagree with the policy decision that was implicit in that, is they just botched a whole bunch of things in it. They didn't have the White House counsel in the room to say, look, we need to run this by our, our prosecutors at the Department of Justice, because they're going to know who's going to challenge this 
what will happen in court, how we're going to react to it, what our legal strategy is. Right? We need to have the people, we need to have the, someone from the uh, Transportation Department or the FAA who's going to talk about the logistics of what happens in an airport. Right? Had they had someone from the FAA in the room, they, that person would have said, because it's what they do all day, what about the people who are in the air when the executive order is signed? Right? Now, if I were managing the policy process, my reaction would have been, ooh, God, I didn't think of that. But that's why you have the FAA person in the room, because that's all they do is they think about these kinds of things. And then you would have talked about it a little bit, and someone would say, what's the right answer? And the FAA person and the, the Customs and Border Patrol people would say, well, you make it pro pro prospective, right? Is that it is, the ban is effective for every flight that lands midnight two days after the executive order is signed. And then you've just eliminated a whole class of obvious implementation problems. Because they didn't do that coordination, they ran into a bunch of unnecessary problems and took a policy that was going to be controversial on its face and weakened the implementation of it. How are we doing on time? Okay.